Today's reading is Mark 10, verse 35 to 45. For those who may wish to follow it in the Church Bibles, it's on page 1015. Page 1015. The request of James and John. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teach you, they said. We want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? he asked. They replied, Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink? or be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink, and be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. This reading is called The Request of James and John, but it's actually a lesson in greatness. Can you hear me? We don't hear um, that word very often, do we, greatness? And this passage is about us in human form, with our limited vision and our desires to get pitted against what Jesus wants for us, the one who has that whole vision. I'm really aware that all of us are at different stages in our faith and our knowledge of the Bible. Our brains are wired all a bit differently, aren't they? And we learn things in different ways and at different speeds. That kind of got me thinking about how my brain was wired. And I guess we'll just believe that one with God. But today I hope that there is a bit of something for everyone and that we're all able to take something away that we've either not known before, something new, or that we've been able to look at possibly in a different way. It's sometimes good to look at the preceding scene before we actually look at the scripture. So we're going to reverse up a bit now and we're actually going to look at verses 32 to 34 which is entitled, Jesus Again Predicts His Death. So here we have a picture, and it does sometimes help to to visualise. So if you can try and just build up a picture in your mind of, of what's going on here. These guys were on their way to Jerusalem, and Jesus was leading the way. And again, he takes them aside and he tells them what was going to happen to him. He told them that the Son of Man would be betrayed, that they would condemn him to death. They would hand him over to the Gentiles who would mock him, who would spit on him, who would flog him and kill him. But three days later, he would rise. It's a really descriptive scene, isn't it? If you stop and you think and you pause over what's happening here, it makes the request of James and John look incredibly and undeniably insensitive. They were actually known as the Sons of Thunder, 
And they liked a bit of confrontation. Was it good to bring this request to the table at this time, so to speak? It's like someone you know really well telling you that they've got about a week to live and the only thing that springs to your mind is what you can have after they die, what your gain might be. These guys said what they thought and just like us, they were hopeless, hopelessly human and remarkably unremarkable. In the reading today, Jesus was giving a more detailed disclosure about the events of his passion and his resurrection, included being handed over to the Gentiles, the Romans. His predictions are fulfilled as we go through Mark and we read in chapters 14 to 16 all the things that were going to happen. The conspiracy against him the anointing at Bethany, that betrayal by Judas, the preparations for the Passover supper, Peter's denial is foretold, Gethsemane, the arrest, Jesus as he stood before the Sanhedrin, before Pilate, the way to the cross, the crucifixion, the death and the resurrection, Remember that picture that we visualised as we were trying to, to visualise how those guys were walking up to Jerusalem? Well, he saw the cross. He knew the events that we have just heard would happen. And they understood very little of it. Perhaps thinking that somehow the event would bring in the kingdom and they dimly saw thrones for themselves. What we see here is James and John trying to secure the best seats in the house, while the others grumble between themselves that it was a bit of an unfair attempt to push in front of them. You can almost picture the scene, can't you? The disciples mumbling and grumbling that James and John got there first. But can we even imagine what was going through Jesus' mind as he strode before the twelve? Absorbed in thoughts of the cross to which he was pressing. They were not thinking about what he was going to suffer, but what they might gain. Does this reflect our world today? What we might gain. What we want to get. Jesus told the disciples on a number of occasions and from time to time that he must go to Jerusalem to suffer many things. And each time Jesus predicts his arrest and his death, the disciples in some way or another manifest their incomprehension. What does Jesus do on each of these occasions? No, he doesn't lose the plot with them. He uses it to teach them new things. It's amazing, isn't it, really? <laughs> to be that stable, that balanced. It's a bit cool. You don't know what you're asking, he says. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptised by the baptism that I am baptised with? Cup and baptism are the references to suffering and death. The disciples don't know that it will come to represent my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. You have to take on board here that the disciples recognised that glorification awaited Jesus, but they saw a visible kingdom on earth with immediate victory and glory. And they wanted a bit of it. Have you noticed the gentle compassion that Jesus had on so many occasions throughout his ministry? He should be angry with what they're asking and asking at such a time. But instead of rebuking James and John, he asks a question. A question that's designed to let them know that what they are asking is wrong. Are you able, he asks. Are you able? 
It doesn't go into specifics, but this question conveys a hint that James and John have invited themselves into a place that was quite different to the one that they were contemplating. Yeah, we're able, they reply. And you can almost hear that enthusiasm in their voice, can't you? James and John know that they've been challenged by Jesus. And they pick up the gauntlet and accept the challenge, but they don't understand the consequences. It's sad to know that later when Jesus was arrested, they weren't so brave. Mark tells us that all of Jesus' disciples deserted and fled. Jesus used the disciples' behaviour as a springboard for more teaching. Here we can be sure that he has their full attention. James and John have got to be a bit embarrassed, haven't they? That their raw ambition of those seats side by side with Jesus has been exposed. The other disciples, a bit indignant, listening carefully, just to ensure that Jesus addresses their concerns. But instead, Jesus instructs them about the kingdom of God, its rules and how it works not what they were expecting. He speaks about what greatness is and what greatness is not. It's interesting to know that as James and John carried on their journeys and at the end of their life, these men, who were known as the sons of thunder, became known for something else. James was the first apostle to be martyred and John became known as the disciple of love. So, how does all of this apply to today and today's living? What is the message here? The request of the disciples brings to light our natural desires to be approved of and rewarded in earthly terms. But Jesus tells us his meaning of real greatness is the service and the care of others. To become great, you first have to become a slave. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And that doesn't quite fit in with today's living, does it? We think that to be great is all about me, exercising authority to get what we want. Climbing the ladder to success is what it's all about, isn't it? But what ladder are we climbing and what does success look like? I guess James and John saw those thrones right and left as success, as greatness. But how do we measure greatness? Our world tends to define greatness in terms of power, privilege and prestige. We measure the importance of a person by external markers, their house the car they drive, the nature of their lifestyle. We get impressed by visible achievements, don't we? People's honours, academic degrees, the importance of somebody's profession, sometimes even the accomplishments of their children. But when Jesus spoke of greatness, he inevitably linked it with service. It's that kind of outside versus inside bit that goes on, isn't it? That flesh and that spirit battle that we have. As he said to James and John, that which makes us great is not our ability to rule over others, but rather our ability to invest ourselves for the welfare of others. In a world where most people want to put as little as necessary into life, and get as much out as possible. Our Lord has a better way. It's different, and it's not easy, is it? Greatness isn't about overcoming one another, being better than each other. It's about covering personal selfishness to help another. To be truly great is to do something to help another, exercising authority in a correct way. We are called. We are called to love. We're called to liberate and to lead and to launch others 
not to think that we are better than others, not to get what we want. Those seats of glory that James and John were after. We're here today, this Sunday morning at Christ Church, because we have chosen to take that step to know more about Jesus. All at different stages. All at different stages in our journey with different gifts, different things to offer, and none of us better than another. We are his disciples, disciples in training in today's world. And we should want to know and to understand more of what we are called to do, both individually and as a church. As we heard earlier, James and John were not called to sit at the side of Jesus. God had a better plan for them. This mad request was part of it. Their ignorance, their wrong thinking, was used as a lesson. So what should we be doing at Christ Church if we are to continue being that caring, serving church? And how should we look as individuals if we are called to be different? Perhaps this clip will help us see a little bit more and remind us of what greatness is all about. I love that launch bit. Somebody being catapulted across the world. Perhaps it was the Bowers. So, I want to leave you with a few things today. I want to ask you, what sort of unreasonable requests do you sometimes make to God? I want you to think about why you make unreasonable requests to God. And I want you to think about what way does God protect you from those foolish requests.